Hello students, I welcome you for the course on introduction to vibrations. Myself, Professor Praveen Gosavi, working as assistant professor in department of mechanical engineering, KIT's College of Engineering, Autonomous Kolhapur. The lesson one is related to the fundamentals of vibrations. So, what are the different fundamentals of vibrations? So, by the definition of vibrations, it is defined as a oscillatory motion of bodies in response to the disturbances. The oscillations occurs due to the presence of a restoring force. You can see vibrations everywhere. In the human body, the eardrums works onto the principle of vibrations. Then your vocal cord, when you speak, when you sing, then while you are walking on the road and running, all cases are dealing with vibrations. Then the vehicles what you are seeing are also having the vibrational impact. So the unbalance which is inside an engine creates vibrations. Then the locomotive wheels of a railway are also examples of vibrations. The rotating machineries like turbines, pumps, fans, reciprocating machines and also the desirable cases of the vibrations are the musical instruments, wherein you are creating vibrations to create a desirable effect. The excessive vibrations can have detrimental effects like noise which is also unwanted sound. It can also have effect onto the loosening of fasteners so that it can have a catastrophic effect in case of loosening of fasteners for steam turbine or engine. Likewise, in the machine tool we are going to witness the tool chatter. So, the chatter is going to effect onto the surface finish of the product what you are machining. Then we can have fatigue failure because in vibrations there is a reversal of load that is sometimes the load is tensile whereas sometimes it will be compressive. The effect of vibration is also discomfort while you are sitting in a vehicle. The vehicle gets shocks from the road irregularities and the passengers who are sitting inside the vehicle can feel discomfort. And when the vibration frequency coincides with the natural frequency, the resonance is going to occur. So, at the resonance, the vibrating body is oscillating with the maximum amplitude. So, in simple terms, a vibratory system involves the transfer of potential energy to kinetic energy and vice versa, which can be alternating in fashion. Now, if there is a mechanism which dissipates the energy, that complete conversion of potential energy to the kinetic energy is not possible, then there will be some dissipation of energy in the form of heat that is known as damping in case of mechanical vibrations. And the effect of damping is diminishing the vibration amplitude gradually. So, basically if you are looking at the vibratory system, it will be comprising of three basic components. One component which is spring or gravity which will be storing the potential energy. The second component can be mass or inertial component which can be storing the kinetic energy. Whereas, the third component damper will be dissipating the vibrational energy. 
So, there are three main components of the vibratory system. Spring, gravity, first component, mass and inertial component, that is the second component and the damper, which is most important to dissipate the energy, which is the third component. Now, if you are talking about a simple pendulum, you can see here, you can see here in you can see here there is a simple pendulum shown so simple pendulum is having one end of the simple pendulum fixed to the frame here and the other end of this string is attached to a concentrated bob now, this pendulum is displaced from its equilibrium position by an angular displacement of theta. Now, this simple pendulum is released from this position. So, let us see what happens. So, you can see here, once this mass of the bob is going to move from position 2 to position 1, there is rise in potential energy. So, there is rise in potential energy. So, let us calculate that magnitude of the potential energy. So, it is m into g into h. So, m is the mass of the bob, g is the gravitational constant and we want to find out this h. So, in this case, for the bob, the bob has been moved from 2 to 1. So, there is rise in its elevation. So, let us find out how much rise we are having. So, that for the rise, total length of your simple pendulum is L and it has been raised by and distance this much. So, if I am able to get the length of the pendulum from O to 1, then I can get the difference of length of the pendulum minus O to 1, I am going to get the rise, the rise of the bob. So, it is L into bracket 1 minus cos theta, that is this is L and this is L cos theta. So, rise of the bob has been done by L minus L cos theta that can be written as L minus L minus L cos theta. So, it is written as L into bracket 1 minus cos theta. Now, if you are looking at the position 2 of the bob, at this point, the pendulum is in equilibrium, whereas when it has been moved from the point 2 to point 1, it has been raised by some height. So, let us calculate the distance through which it has been raised. So, the total length of the pendulum is L and the rise in the pendulum bob has been happened by the distance L into bracket 1 minus cos theta. So, at the position 1, the bob is having highest potential energy. Once the bob has been left to oscillate from the position 1, it is going to oscillate. So, it is going to move from position 1 towards position 2. So, at the position 2, there is a conversion of kinetic energy at, as the bob moves from position 1 to position 2, there is conversion of maximum potential energy to the maximum kinetic energy. 
once the bob is going to move away from position 2 towards position 3, then it is going to have complete conversion of kinetic energy to the potential energy. So, at the position 1 and 3, we will have maximum potential energy, whereas at the position 2, we will have maximum kinetic energy. That is, velocity will be maximum at the point 2. Now, if this has been done inside and vacuum, the complete conversion of potential energy to the kinetic energy and vice versa is possible. Whereas, if this experiment is done in an atmospheric pressure in the presence of air, then there will be some aerodynamic drag and pivot friction which will dissipate the energy because of that the pendulum starts oscillating with lesser and lesser amplitude and after some amount of time it is going to come back to the equilibrium position. Now, there is an important term related to the vibratory body known as degrees of freedom. So, what is degrees of freedom? By the definition of it, it is the number of degrees of freedom is defined as number of independent coordinates which are required to completely determine the motion of all the parts of the system at any point of time. So, degrees of freedom is nothing but number of independent coordinates required to specify the position or motion of an object at any point of time. So, you can see here there is a slider crank spring mechanism. So, there is a slider, there is a spring which is attached and there is a crank. So, now if I am looking at the slider crank mechanism, the mechanism is mechanism, the mechanism can be specified by the angle theta at any time to specify the position or motion of all the components of that mechanism. So, this is an example of single degree of freedom system. Likewise, in the figure B, you can see spring mass system. So, there is a spring, there is a mass. Now, this mass is placed onto the rollers. So, it can only translate in x direction. So, again it is an example of single degree of freedom system. Likewise, in the figure C, you can see a torsional system wherein a shaft is attached to the disc. So, the disc can only have rotation through an angular displacement of theta. So, it can only have single degree of freedom. Likewise, we can have two degrees of freedom systems. So, there are two springs and two masses as shown in the figure A. So, there can be treated as two degrees of freedom system that is both the masses can only translate in x direction, but mass m1 will be translating in x1 direction by x1 amount and mass m2 is going to have translation in x2 magnitude. Likewise, in the figure B, there are two rotors J1 and J2, which has been rotated through an angular displacement of theta1 and theta2. Likewise, you can see in the figure C, there is a spring mass pendulum arrangement. The mass can be displaced through an angular displacement of the mass. The mass can be translated through an magnitude of x, whereas your pendulum can be displaced through an angular displacement of theta. So, there are also example of three degrees of freedom system. So, masses m1, m2, m3 can have translation through an magnitude of x1, x2, x3 respectively. Likewise, we can have three pendulum attached to each other l1, l2, l3 and the masses of it are having an angular displacement of theta1, theta2, theta3. Likewise, we can have three rotors as shown in figure C, wherein the, ma 
the J1 is rotated through an angular displacement of theta 1, J2 is displaced through theta 2 and J3 is displaced through theta 3. So, basically if I am looking for finding out the degrees of freedom of an system, approximate way to find it out is the number of masses present inside the system gives you the number of degrees of freedom associated with it. Now, the next classification of vibration is free and forced vibration. So, free vibrations is nothing but if the initial disturbance is given to the system and the system is left to vibrate without the influence of external force, then it will be called as free vibration. Forced vibration is a, a vibratory system wherein external force always simulates the vibratory system and if the excitation frequency of that vibratory force matches with the natural frequency, then resonance will happen. The next classification is undamped vibration and damped vibrations. Undamped vibrations is nothing but there will be no dissipation of energy that is there is absence of damping. Whereas, damped vibration is nothing but there will be a dissipation of energy which is of significant magnitude which is having effect as the vibration amplitude goes on decaying. The next classification is the next classification is linear and nonlinear vibrations. The linear vibrations are wherein all the elements of the vibratory system, mass, spring, damper, are going to behave linearly. Whereas for nonlinear vibrations, one or more element of the vibratory system are not behaving linearly. That is, they are behaving non-linear. The next classification is deterministic and random vibrations. Deterministic vibrations can be defined as wherein the vibration amplitude or frequency can be determined. Whereas, the random vibration is nothing but wherein your vibration amplitude or frequency can't be determined. The random vibrations are also known as non-deterministic vibrations. The next point of discussion is vibration analysis. For the vibration analysis, you require an input which is excitation and you have to measure the output which is the response. And both of these inputs and outputs should be with respect to time. The response depend on to the initial conditions and the external forces. Most of the practical systems are very complex and the mathematical model of it requires simplification. The procedure to do the vibration analysis is as follows. The first step is to do the mathematical modeling. The second step is deriving the governing equation. The third step is solving of equations for specific boundary conditions and external forces and the fourth step is interpretation of solutions. So, the interpretation of solutions comprising of vibration amplitude, it can be displacement, velocity and acceleration.